Um, turn back to Luke chapter 24. It's okay this morning. I might go off script today. There is one thing that keeps laying in my mind and my heart. Um, and we might skip it towards the end of the sermon to John. Verse 5 in Luke 24 says, And they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. And they said unto them, the angel said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? And this is the phrase that keeps sticking to me. I'm not sure how if you have a, a mini sermon here before the sermon. But all morning it's, been bothering me or last night and this morning and I'm not sure if the word bother but it's just playing playing on me he is not here why seek ye the living among the dead he is not here they went looking for Jesus did they not they wanted to prepare his body for the 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 grave uh, because of the Passover they were not allowed to they were not able to and after watching that video and I saw it just come burn on that screen, he is not here. Our Savior is a living Savior. Uh, you can go and find Muhammad's tomb and his body. You can find Buddhists and Confucius. You can find them. They're there. But try to find Jesus in his tomb. He's not there. Not only that. Jesus is only in the living, not the dead. What do you mean, Michael? He said, why do you seek the living among the dead? The Bible tells us that we are all sinners. And for the wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us that if we're not Christians, if we're not saved, we're dead men. We're dead. And you will not find Jesus among the dead. If you're not a Christian, he is not here in your life. He is not here in your home. He is not here with you at work. He's not among the dead. He's among the living. The Bible tells us, and we're going to read as we probably will skip down here at the end, that he died and rose again so we could be alive. Jesus said, I've come to give you not just life, but abundant life. Jesus is always among the living Christians, that's us. When we become a Christian, we accept Christ as our Savior. We ask Him to forgive us of our sins and wash away our sins. We accept His sacrifice by faith. He becomes living among us because we are now alive. Alive in Christ. Jesus is in my home. He is in my work. He's in my church. He's here. He's not among the dead. So why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. There are a lot of dead churches. They do not preach the gospel. They preach salvation by works. We can name a lot of them. By the way, the Bible tells me that all my works are as filthy rags. I don't care how good you are. You will never measure up. You can never earn what is given freely. And there are churches that are dead, dead preachers, dead priests, dead pastors, 
dead churches. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus is not there. You will not find him there. He's not among the dead. He's among the living. There are homes out there. and People are lost and dying and going to hell. And you're not going to find Jesus there. He's nowhere to be found. He's not among the dead. And we see it in homes. We see children abused physically. We see them abused sexually. That's not where Jesus is. He's not there. What the world needs. Somebody asked me one time because uh, they said, Michael, you always seem to have all the answers. They were trying to be a smart aleck. They said, uh, what would save Chicago? What does Chicago need? I said, it's really easy. That's an easy answer. And they said, <laughs> they started giggling. And I said, Jesus. They need Jesus. What does Nashville, Indiana need? Jesus. What do our homes need? Jesus. What do you need in your life? Your life's messed up. It's all going different directions. You have no answers. You know what you need? Jesus. Is he there? He's not among the dead. Sometimes Christians can be dead spiritually. Their life is gone haywire. And it's almost like Jesus is not there, is it right? There's nothing worse than a Christian with a hole in his heart. Been there, done that. You know what you need? Jesus. By the way, where do you think we find him? With other Christians, right? With other Christians. I wonder where other Christians gather a lot. Where could you find a lot of other Christians? I know. Church. Church. I wonder where I could learn about Jesus and, and know him better. I wonder where that could happen. I mean, if only there was a maybe a book. That could teach me about Jesus. By the way, there is. What you need to live this life and to be among the living is Jesus. We do not need less Jesus. We need more. And we could preach more of Jesus and we need to teach more of Jesus. That's what we need. To bring our lives back to life. Those who testify and tell you. They go astray for a while. They go wandering for a while. It wasn't more booze that got them back. It wasn't more immorality. I'm just not sinning enough. It wasn't more hatred that got them back. Every one of them will testify straight to your face. Those that have come back to where they're supposed to be, it was Jesus. They began to seek Jesus again because he brings things to life. You want to live life, you want to enjoy life, truly enjoy it, you truly want to be alive in this life? Is he there? Is he there in your life? Christian, is he there? Can you reach out and touch him? Daily, do you read his word? Daily, do you have prayer time where you pray to him and speak to him? Are you ministering for him? Is he there? Lost person, if you're among us, he's not there. He's not there. Can be, but he's not 
there. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. I think that might be a sermon I can flesh out someday, but it was bothering me. So that's why I went there. Let's look at John. Uh, we, we were going to study the different apostles and how the resurrection affected their lives. And I'm going to tell you a little bit. Uh, we read where Peter and John ran immediately when Mary came and said that he's gone. He's gone. They couldn't find him. She said, I don't know where they've taken him. Because he wasn't there. And so they ran and we found out that John is more of a track star because John outran Peter and got there first. As we read in Scripture, when we got there, Peter and John look and they see the grave clothes still wrapped up. I love that video. Still wrapped up, even took the napkin. Jesus took the time. This is how much of a gentleman he was. He must have had a really good mother because he took the time to fold it up and put it down. He took the napkin that was over his face and folded it up. He wasn't there. The Bible says that they went back and they began to talk among each other and, and try to figure out what's going on. They're afraid that somebody stole his body, that they would be blamed. Who knows? All the fears that were running through their minds and their hearts at that time. Jesus was gone. His body was gone. They saw him de die themselves and now his body's gone. Uh, we don't know what's going on. And the Bible says all of a sudden, Jesus appeared to them. And their lives were never the same. Everything that he'd been teaching them, everything that he had showed them, all of a sudden hit. He actually meant he was going to raise from the dead. Guess what? This is God in the flesh. God in the flesh. Because what man can conquer death? No man. And these men's lives were changed forever. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and Peter preached, you know what he preached about? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul, the Bible tells us about Paul. Paul was an uh, evil man. Uh, he was very religious. I know that sounds contradictory, but it's the truth. You can be both an evil man and religious. There are a lot of them out there. A lot of them. One of them is named Pope. I'm sorry. Some people don't like it when you name things like that, but he's an evil man. Anybody who says they're God in the flesh is a liar and evil. Very religious, but evil. That was Paul. He was so evil. The Bible says he went out and killed these new Christians. Thought he was doing God a service. It's amazing as he has, he's trying, he kills all the Christians he can in Jerusalem. And he hears there's this outbreak of Christians in uh, Damascus. And he's going there to kill them. And he's got letters and permission to kill them. And he's going to go kill them. And as he's going, the Bible says he saw the resurrected Christ and spoke to him. He says, why is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? You know what that means? Paul was there when Jesus was crucified. He saw the crucifixion. He saw it. He saw the earthquake that happened after he, Jesus died. You didn't see it in the video, but when he said it was finished and he gave up his spirit, there was an earthquake. And the veil was torn in two at the temple. From top to bottom, that was God himself saying, now man can reach God on his own. 
He heard about that. He was there. He had to see the graves that popped open because of the earthquake and people rose from the dead. We forget about that story. But there were people who rose from the dead the day Jesus died. It was not just a normal, everyday death. It was supernatural. The Bible tells us that when the first disciple was stoned, Stephen, Paul was there and he heard his sermon. And he saw his face as they stoned him. He heard the words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Wait a minute, where have I heard those words before he thought? Jesus on the cross. So was it hard for him to kick against the pricks? Paul, you're being convicted. You know I'm true. You know I'm God. Why are you fighting it, he's saying. And there are people out there today, even today, that'll listen to sermons and they'll get convicted and they'll, they'll be uh, burdened with it. And they know they need to become a Christian. They know they need to accept Christ as their Savior. But they'll fight against it. And until you're like Paul and you see the resurrected Christ and realize what he did for you. And there he is on the road to Damascus. A preacher friend of mine calls it Damascus. The mask is taken off. He saw the resurrected Christ. And Paul's life was never the same. Christians, it's good that we spend a day out of the year to look at the resurrected Christ. But maybe we should spend more time of it as we go through the year. Because if we really study it, if we really look at it, and we really know it, and how he brings life to us, and peace, and comfort, and joy, and strength, and power because of his resurrection. It will change your life. You'll never be the same. And those of us who have gone astray and have come back and hung on to that resurrection know exactly what I'm talking about. Your life is never the same. Those of you who were lost, truly lost. And turned to Jesus because of his resurrection, your life is never the same. And neither was Paul's. And Paul, you know what he taught and preached wherever he went? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. So much so, people wanted to talk to him about this resurrection thing. It was brand new. Nobody had heard of that before. And many a soul got saved because of Paul's ministry. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. John, we're going to skip all the way to the number three, the apostle John, he believes in the resurrection also. John was there. He saw the body gone. He saw John was the only disciple at the cross. There were a bunch of women, but John was the only one at the cross. He saw the death. He saw the burial. He saw the resurrection. He knew it better than anyone. And what does he say? John states he was one of the witnesses of the word of life that Jesus was the life. Let's look at first John chapter one, verses one and two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. I was a witness of Jesus Christ's life. I was a witness of his death and I was a witness of of his bodily resurrection. I saw him. And have looked upon. And our hands handled. They touched Jesus Christ. After his resurrection. The Bible says. They put their hands through his nail prints. Through his holes. They put their hands in the side. Where, the, where he was pierced. And they held him. It was not a spiritual Resurrection. It was a physical. His body was there. He said, we saw him. We looked on him. We held him. What? 
the word of life. The word of life. Now what we just talked about, wherever Jesus goes, he brings what? Life. You know, Jesus didn't like funerals. You ever read in the Bible, whenever he was near a funeral, he would raise people from the dead. One time there was a funeral just coming by and he just touched and said, get up, get out of there. He didn't like funerals because he brought life, not death. And we held the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show it unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us eternal life life that is what is offered to us for the wages of sin is death because i'm a christian because i have put my faith in god and he has saved me i never have to fear death Amen. ever and i don't have to fear hell or the lake of fire never i have eternal life because that's what jesus brings and that's where jesus is in life the living First John chapter four, verses 14 and 15. And we have seen and do testify. It says, I've seen it and I testify to it. This is what I teach. This is what I preach. He says, this is my testimony that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. And whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. You believe this? He says, if you put your faith in this, that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world, he died, shed his blood and was resurrected to save us from our sins. If you believe that you're in God and God in you, because God is in the living, not the dead. John teaches that life, of, that the life of Jesus brings us life. First John chapter five, 11 through 13 and this is the record that God hath given unto us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life is dead. Dead forever. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I love that, that you may know that you have eternal life. I remember one time I was at work at the nursing home in Chicago and uh, they made some kind of rule chains and they made a couple of them and, and they just do it all of a sudden and people are at break and they're all talking about it and they're all complaining about it and all that. And somebody, some girl just asked me, I'm sitting there by myself, minding my own business. She goes, what do you know, Mike? about the rule and all that. Basically, she wanted my opinion. I said, you know, I only know two things. Really? What are the two things? First of all, no matter where I live in this world, I'm gonna to have to pay taxes. There is no escaping taxes. No matter where I go, some government, some entity is going to tax me. And they all laugh, yeah. What's the other thing you know? When I die, I'll go to heaven. I know that. And the lady said to me, how arrogant, how arrogant of you I said, no, it's not because of me. Listen, it's not because of anything I've done. It's not because I'm uh, special, uh, not because and uh, I'm not good at all. The Bible says there is none good. No, not one. It's all because of what he's done for me. And all I've done is put my faith in that. And as soon as I have, I know I have eternal life because it's based on the promise of God who does not lie, never lies, never changes his mind. And I will live forever because Jesus brings life and that's where he is. And I know where I'll be. Do you? I do not fear hell. I do not fear the lake of fire. I have eternal life. Call that arrogant all you want. It has nothing to do with me. Trust me. But I do not fear it. I've seen people die who feared it. Struggle for life. The last breath. I knew a man who began to, basically his body began to decay because he was done. His 
life was going, would not accept Jesus Christ as his savior, but was hanging on to life because he feared what was gonna happen next. Those are horrible deaths. I've been to Christian's deaths. They smile. Let me go home. I'm ready to go home. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. First John chapter 5, verse 20, this apostle writes, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even the Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Did you see this? The Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God. Why would John make such a statement if he had not witnessed what? The resurrection. Change John's life. Listen to me. All of the disciples, all of them, suffered horrible deaths. James, the first one, beheaded. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified, some say upside down. John, the only one who did not die from uh, being a martyr, we know for a fact that they tried to boil him in oil once, probably crippled him, probably the oil made his eyes made blind him. They, they figured they couldn't kill him. So they put him in an island, a deserted island by himself. That's where he wrote the book of Revelation, by the way. And there he died, probably suffering from all his torment. Others were, one disciple was uh, filleted, skinned alive and filleted. Many more were crucified. One died by lions, hungry lions. And you know what could have stopped any of their deaths? Do you know what it was that they died for? At any time, if one of the disciples had taken the body of Christ, all they had to do was take their captures to the body and live. Correct? Thirteen men died because they believed in the resurrection. At any time, they could say, no, we made it all up. No. You know how difficult it is to have conspiracies? You ever heard the term, if you got two people that have a secret, one of them's got to go? Imagine 13 people trying to pull off a conspiracy of the century. Nobody's going to die for a lie. Nevertheless, 13 people, they believe this. A hundred percent. They saw it. They felt him. They talked to him. Jesus was their God. Because he was alive. And we have difficulties coming to church. Don't tell me you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me it's changed your life. Don't tell me how dramatic it is. Show me. Show me. These men believed it. And died for it. And you won't even open your Bible. Has the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed your life? It saved your soul. Yes. Many of Christians going to heaven, but never allow God to really change their life. How serious are you about this? I've said this a gazillion times, not here. But it's true. Every Christian reaches a point in their life where they have to decide, is this real or not? Is this Jesus thing? Is this Bible thing? Is this God thing real or it's not? I've reached that point in my life. 
and so have you. And some say, well, I believe most of it. But others say, it's real. And it means everything to me. His resurrection will change your life. It will change your children's life. It will change people, your friend's life. Jesus Christ came to bring life, not death. And what gave him authority and what gave him power and what gave him the strength to say all that he said was his resurrection. His death would mean nothing. Don't, I'm not trying to minimize it, but listen to me. It would mean nothing. It would just be another man who died. And we have a lot of them, don't we? And we have a lot of martyrs in life. People who died for a cause. But it doesn't really save a soul, does it? Or change the world. Did you know these 13 men? I keep saying 13 because they had chose a 12th one. And then Paul. Did you know the Bible talks about how they turned the world upside down? They were accused of stirring up the world. With what message? Jesus Christ lives. He's alive. And because he lives, so can I. Amen. And so can you. Has it changed your life? Has it saved your soul? That's what the resurrection is. Listen to me. If you're not a Christian, he's not here. He doesn't stay among the dead. If you are a Christian, is he there? Because he doesn't stay among the dead. Either you're alive to Christ or you're not. Either you're living for Christ or you're not. There is no halfways. Are you serious about his resurrection? I'm not asking you to be crucified. I'm not asking you to be burned at the stake. I'm not asking any of those things. I'm just asking you to come to church and open your Bible and to minister to people. I think that's pretty much exactly what God wants from us. But if you can't take in that serious, God is not there. I don't know about you guys, and I pray about it every service. I want God here. I want him here. But he's only among the living, not the dead. Let us pray.